Thank you. I'd like to welcome you all to this session. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm preaching a sermon in a European cathedral here with, with the number of us in this large room. But nevertheless, I thank you very much for coming out this afternoon. And I'm going to be tag teaming this performance here with my colleague Kate Murray from the Library of Congress. So we'll take just a moment to introduce ourselves and we'll launch right in here. My name is Chris Prom. I am an archivist at the University of Illinois and also a faculty member. For the past, uh, oh, about 18 months or so, I've been co-chairing a task force on technical approaches to email archives along with Kate. So Kate, if you just introduce. Sure. So I'm Kate Murray, and uh, I work at the Library of Congress, and I specialize in digital file formats. Um, and I've been working with email and related uh, personal information management uh, formats for a number of years. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be co-chairing this with Chris. So why don't we just start our presentation? Sure. So this is a topic of deep interest to me as an archivist. We have email collections at the University of Illinois that we manage, and in addition to that, I wrote a technical report about email archives several years ago. So the purpose of this task force, which is sponsored by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and, the digital, and our partners, the Digital Preservation Coalition in the UK, is to assess current tools, methodologies, approaches, and conceptual models that can be used to acquire born digital correspondence and to manage it as an archival resource or as a curatorial resource in, in repositories. Um, we would, of course, like to thank both the Mellon Foundation and DPC for supporting the work. The charge of the group, as you can see from this slide here, essentially is a technical charge. We very explicitly ruled out policy development and legal analysis and things along those lines, um, both because they're very difficult, but also because they vary considerably from institution to institution, from case to case, and more to the point, from continent to continent. Um, as, as those of you who have been following the news for the past few days know, um, the European context for information policy and personal information management is quite different than the U.S. perspective. So we were really interested in ass assessing technical approaches that can meet a wide variety of operational contexts and legal contexts. Um, we do have a quite broad membership uh, composed of an executive committee, myself, Kate, um, a few other people, and then a larger group which helped to author a report which will be issued relatively soon. And um, we've, been, we've been very um, pleased with the group. The group has, has really done some excellent work which you'll, which you'll hear about in just a moment. Would like to note in particular that we've had some representatives from industry engaged in the project, particularly from Google and Microsoft who have both brought an interesting and complementary perspective on on the types of issues that we're, we're dealing with in, in archives. In addition to that, the group has had some um, friends, some people who have been given early access to the report and really offered us interesting and useful feedback. Um, you know, these range from state archivist groups, uh, COSA, NAGARA, um, through and including um, institutions like NHP, grant, granting agencies like NHPRC. Um, one particularly fruitful avenue of feedback for us has been two briefing days which we held in the United Kingdom where we presented our work, initial versions of our work at the UK National Archives and then um, again at a, um, at, at a conference facility in central London back in, in January. One of the outcomes of the report is actually quite a bit of supplementary documentation which we believe has considerable value in its own right. Um, in authoring a report of this nature, obviously there are many resources that are developed and are useful, but just can't fit into, into the report itself. So we've uh, gone ahead and made those available on our uh, project website. These talk about things like email user features, um, privacy issues, guides to email standards, things that are really, really hard to track down that you can track down if you want to by reading IETF standards documents or things along those lines, but, but just are, are hard to find in one place. So those are, those are a useful output put from the report and we'll continue to, to support them. Just to give a quick update, current status, um, we did submit a manuscript of the report to CLEAR, who will be acting as publisher in late March. And that's currently going through editing, and we expect it to be published in, um, you know, early June, probably by the time everything's said and done. 
Meanwhile, we are continuing to discuss potential follow-on work from the report, which is really the purpose of our, of our presenting here, to give a summary of the report and more particularly to focus on the recommendations from the report, leaving considerable amount of time for discussion, questions, and commentary so that whatever work is brought forward from the task force report can meet the needs of the community as optimally as necessary. So with that brief introduction, I'll turn, turn things over to Kate, who will describe um, some of the main body parts of the report before we turn to the recommendations. Um, so the rec as Chris just mentioned, um, I'm, we're just going to do a high-level overview of the sections of the report. Um, the, uh, the first section of the report um, addresses recognizing the value of email, and um, both Chris and I sat in uh, the executive roundtables around researcher use of email uh, yesterday and today, um, and uh, these topics came up, and certainly in mine and perhaps in Chris's as well, but um, uh, you know, what da data lies within an email collection, who might find it useful, and why is accessioning problematic? So we discussed those in the first section. So um, just a little bit on this image, it's um, Rodan uh, call to arms. And um, what we really wanted to get across in the report um, is that email is really technology bound, right? And the technology needs to be active and focused with care and feeding. Um, if it doesn't, the data within will remain inaccessible and unaccessed un until these bonds are broken. So um, um, the, the call to arms is now, the time to act is now, and the people to do it are in this room and lots of others that are not in this room. Um, so some of the things that need to change, um, we need to embrace email as a complex research data object. We need to harness new technologies like NLP, natural language processing, and machine learning. We need to encourage content creators to take active role in its preservation, um, even for personal papers. Um, and we need to build towards greater tool interoperability and towards deeper community integration and engagement. So in the section, second section of the report, um, we uh, talk about the email lifecycle. Um, and email really has, uh, comes from two perspectives. One is a records management perspective, um, which is typically uh, well integrated um, if you're in a large institution. Um, the other one is when email comes in through uh, gifts and um, personal papers. Um, and those are really two completely separate things. Um, if it's in uh, a records management, um, it's part of typically a formalized record management program, but if it's coming in through a donated materials context, the email is usually outside of records management, record keeping structure, typically without organization or conscious retention about, uh, conscious attention about what has been retained or deleted. Um, this is a representation model um, that we're using to demonstrate how uh, that a life cycle applies to email in general. Um, as it, email moves through the life cycle from creation and appraisal to acquisition and processing to preservation, discovery, and finally access, we encounter lots of different players with different needs and many technological challenges. Decisions have been made that have strong implications at every stage further down the chain. And along this life cycle, various players from the correspondents to the collectors may decide to keep or weed any of the messages or attachments um, or any of the associated data that travels with them. So the third section of the report, uh, we dive deep into really what is email from a technical perspective and how it works. And given its ubiquity, you would think that it's well understood or documented, um, but in fact it's really not, not as well documented as one might hope. At its heart, email is a transaction, right? In the case of an email, we take the message component, um, that's the actual email message, but that also might include attachments, and um, something that came up in my executive roundtable this morning, um, links to um, external data, right, networked data, um, and how does that uh, factor into to capturing email? Are we now doing uh, web archiving in addition to email archiving? Um, and, and as well as other features beyond text. Um, so it's really kind of difficult sometimes to draw the line around the box of what is email. It's really not as, as obvious as you might think it is. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Chris. Okay, so after reviewing essentially what email is from a documentary point of view and sort of to set the stage for challenges that can be, and, and approaches that can be used to capturing it, the report includes a brief assessment of current trends both in industry related to email as, as well as in repositories, as well as in archival repositories. So um, uh, there's a good section of the report that talks about what's happening in the broader community because obviously email services are a very, very big industry. 
Um, there are you know, lots of things that go around uh, go, that are uh, lots of services sold around authenticating email, um, trying to prevent spam and phishing attacks and all of those kinds of things. And these abuse prevention technologies can both assist and complicate the fact of, or the, the attempt to preserve email or make it accessible over the long run. Uh, another area of really strong interest to us are um, tools that focus around compliance, business compliance, and legal discovery, because the industry has developed, for various obvious reasons, for any of those of you who have been following the news um, <laughs> recently will know, um, means to look into and desire to look into what's happening in any kind of a communication technology, email being a primary one of those. Um, the problem with a lot of these tools is that while they're very useful for legal discovery, they're also very, very expensive. And they provide many features that could potentially be very useful to archivists or curators who might want to, for example, redact a collection or identify or classify correspondence that really is out of scope for public access or really any kind of access because of legal restrictions or what have you. But they're just simply beyond the reach of most, most archives. So, you know, much like the lawyer in this joke, they're, they're very, very useful, but they're also potentially very, very expensive. So one area for potential work within the community is to develop open source versions of some of these tools or to work on business pricing models that would complement, you know, what um, high-priced New York law firms pay for these tools. One of the more interesting uh, moments in the in the work that we did was hearing from a lawyer actually who was involved in the LIBO investigations um, leading to very large fine for Barclays Bank and for some other banks. And he pointed out that they're essentially in the same type of business of telling a story as historians are trying to piece together evidence. So these tools have a lot of potential use, but perhaps in a slightly different way. Um, the report also spends a fair bit of time assessing repository challenges, specifically around capturing email materials. Because they sit in a variety of systems, it's very, very difficult. They come from um, you know, Outlook, they come from a lot of different services, and they, they all need to be handled somewhat differently. Also around ensuring authenticity, tracking processing actions. Um, Kate has already mentioned the difficulty of dealing with attachments and linked content. I know in the executive roundtable session that I attended yesterday, there was very interesting discussion around the fact that maybe within email collections, you have very, very interesting documents that are attached, and those might in themselves be preservation objects worthy of attention. Um, because as a transaction, as a report is sent from someone to someone else, there's a bit of evidence around that, and the report itself might have value, but how do you, how do you preserve it? Um, then security and privacy issues and also processing at scale are, are some of the challenges that libraries and archives would face when dealing with email collections. Um, so uh, one key section of the report uh, is uh, about potential solution and, and some sample workflows. Um, the, there's nothing necessarily new here about the various preservation approaches. Um, the first one would be bit level preservation, which I describe as you get what you get and you don't get upset. And I would say that for the most part with email collections, that's what uh, people are implementing. So they are ingesting the email collections, um, you know, maybe they bag it, they ingest it, but there's no access to it. There's typically no processing, there's no appraisal to it um, because they haven't built up those tools yet. Um, format migration uh, is a big, uh, part of email um, archiving, mostly because tools such as uh, EPAD and, and some other tools are uh, format dependent. So um, there's a lot of uh, format migration that happens. Um, uh, and emulation, I would say for uh, email archiving, it's really an opportunity, I think, where emulation can really shine, right? So uh, if you're looking to um, explore email in its native um, uh, 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 environment, um, I think, uh, it's a great opportunity for emulation to do that. Um, in the report, we have a number, uh, we did a, an extensive review of tools from both within the cultural heritage community and um, other communities, including um, legal discovery. Um, those tools are, uh, a review of those tools are on um, our website, um, but one of our recommendations is gonna be to move them to Copter to help keep them um, more current. Um, 
Uh, and we also have uh, sample workflows from um, each of the different um, preservation uh, options um, that you can um, adopt uh, from uh, organizations such as Stanford and Harvard, um, the Smithsonian, and, and others. Um, so the, really the meat of this report, uh, or the meat of our talk today, um, is really about the recommendations and the next steps. Um, so we have organized our recommendations um, into sort of two categories, um, community engagement um, and advocacy, and another one around tools uh, and tooling. And then we further subdivided those into what we call sort of low barrier um, uh, activities and then um, higher uh, impact activities. So the first uh, section that we're gonna talk about um, and remember I said on an earlier slide is the people that should do this work is you and, and me, you, the royal you, which would include myself. Um, so we have a number of um, what we call lower, low barrier activities that can sort of self-organize and members, we should say members of the task force, um, are, are uh, hopeful that we'll be able to participate in this work as well. So the first one is about assessing institutional readiness. And uh, what we would like to do there is to um, make a version of the NDSA levels of digital preservation specific around email. So it would help individual institutions understand where they fall on the spectrum. Are they, are they just, um, are they ready to ingest email at all? Are they bit level preservation ready? Um, or, or are they uh, further along uh, on the spectrum? Um, the second one is, uh, and I, would, I should also say that we heard a lot of echoes around this in our um, executive, in my executive roundtable, and probably Chris did as well. Um, the need for um, skilling up of existing staff and new staff to deal with email collection. So what are the issues around uh, what makes email challenging, what makes email special, uh, and how can, what tools are available, um, and, and uh, what, what do folks need to know uh, in order to be uh, email archiving ready. Uh, we have heard the next one quite a bit, that there's an issue of trust with donors um, donating their uh, email collections to institutions. And um, one of the recommendations from the task force is um, to develop sort of a template to uh, have staff be able to talk with donors about what those issues are, to sort of take that fear away, um, to understand what uh, is possible to redact and what is possible to, um, what tools can do around sensitivity review um, to help demystify the email process for donors. There's uh, we didn't mention this earlier, but email is really uh, a, a domain in which the personal and the private and the professional intermingle, right? You typically, uh, my boss is in the audience, so of course I never use my work email for anything personal, but people often um, use uh, e email for multiple purposes, right? You might be talking about making a lunch plan or, or um, you know, and your next email is about, um, you, you know, some, some major event uh, at work. So um, there's really an intermingling of those, and I think that's partially the fear that donors have um, in, in, uh, in sending their email along. Um, I mentioned earlier the idea to move our assessment of email tools into Copter. Um, and uh, finally, another one is to develop a format comparison matrix for email formats. Um, there are certainly models for this. In my day job, um, I run the FAGI, the Federal Agency's Digital Guidelines Initiative Group, and we've done a lot of work on the audiovisual working group of that. And we've done a lot of work around format comparisons. Um, and um, I think it would be very interesting to lay out a format comparison matrix around popular email formats, both proprietary um, and not proprietary. Um, so some of the higher impact activities for community engagement um, is really around sustaining the email archiving community. So um, we're not ready to move yet, potentially, to um, consortial activities for um, some of the open source email tools, um, but we really need to think about how we can sustain some of the tools that are already out there. Um, uh, another one is around um, planning specification for beginning of lifecycle tools. And in the US, certainly, um, the state agency, state government repository programs have taken the lead in customizing some of the enterprise level tools that have been effective for capturing and identifying and managing records. Um, but the wider community can learn from their experiences, um, potentially through a summit or a collaborative knowledge sharing project. Um, 
a big one is sort of developing criteria for what makes an email authentic, right? Um, so if you're, um, if, if the email has gone through format migration or has been ingested, what are the key components of that email that says it's, the, it's at its essence what it's supposed to be, what it declares it should be? Um, one of my favorites, my standard joke around these things is that because I, uh, another part of my day job is the sustainability of digital formats website at the Library of Congress in which I read the RFCs so you don't have to, right? I've read the RFCs for MBOX and they are unclear, right? They don't specify all of the different versions of MBOX um, and there is no RFC for EML, right? It's based off uh, another um, format. So uh, it would be great to notch up the standards documentation for these email formats. Um, Yet another one is, um, and I'll talk quickly, um, <laughs> is um, to improve PDF as, a, as a, um, a viable function for email. We all have in our um, email systems you know, export to PDF. But if you export to PDF, you typically lose a lot of your head header metadata. Um, you potentially lose some threading. You might not have your attachments, et cetera, et cetera. The PDF community, especially the PDF association, is super keen to help us with this problem if we can define requirements for what makes a, uh, what is authentic about a P, what is authentic about an email that could be translated into the PDF format, gosh, they're all over that because that's a huge new market share for them. Um, and some of the members of the task force, including the Library of Congress and the National Archives, are a member of the PDF Association and they're very keen to work with that. And, and finally, um, to demonstrate email as a research, um, uh, a, a, a source of research data. We call this sort of our data challenge um, in which we would work with some, potentially work with some organizations who could provide open, full access to email collections, invite some scholars and some digital humanity people in to do research, um, and then have them write about what their research experience was um, and the, the research that could not have been possible if they did not have access to a, an email collection. And Chris is going to wrap us up. Right. And then, as, as Kate indicated, the second set of recommendations is really based around tooling and tool support. Um, some of these, for instance, can be really high impact activities. So, for example, the PDF one that Kate mentioned, if um, vendors of tools were able to um, you know, produce better PDF files when people print them from Outlook or whatever, the filing of those would be much better. There are still a lot of archives that are, are following a sort of print and file approach, so there are a lot of things that can be done in, in that respect. But on the low barrier side of things, one of the first steps would really be to test the existing tools that are out there and say exactly and find out a little bit more about how they do at retaining data or not retaining data. There's just a real basic level of um, of sort of basic research knowledge that we don't have about how these tools work when you move things from one format to another. Which leads into the second point about improving tool um, of the format identification, characterization, and validation tools. So if you take a message, export it from Outlook as a PST file, run it through um, some of the tools that exist, such as EPAD or Tomes or some of the industry tools, do you really know what you got out on the other side is the same thing as what you put in? So that's, again, a real basic research question around which we'd like to do some additional testing. Then some of the higher impact activities, I think these could be really interesting research projects, um, bringing multiple um, fields into play, including curatorial practice in archives as well as computational approaches, uh, machine learning approaches and, and artificial intelligence approaches. One of the biggest needs actually are for improved tools around sensitivity review. Um, I think those of us who have worked with uh, people in universities who have email they'd like to preserve or legal counsel who would like to see a lot of email go away know that one of the biggest concerns is trying to f filter out things that might need to be restricted for, for legal reasons or what have you. And the tools are pretty good, um, but again, there's a real lack of knowledge around whether they're better than a human or not better than a human. I would think that if we can do facial recognition technologies as well as we can, we can probably do good sensitivity review around text-based collections as well. So there's quite a bit of opportunity there for additional work. Um, another really interesting theme that focused in discussions of the group as well as in the executive roundtables yesterday and today was the desire for a self-archiving tool. 
So as people leave positions, as they move from institution to institution, they may have a desire or a need to take records with them for their own um, you know, uh, institutional or personal memory or to pass on to somebody else. And there are a lot of very idi idiosyncratic practices that take place around this. And in addition, such a service, if it's scoped properly, I think could be of um, quite useful for people who want to maintain a record of their own um, correspondence under their own control. It wouldn't necessarily need to include just email records. It could include other types of documentation as well, whether they're taking place from Slack or uh, you know, Twitter or whatever uses an API. So I, I think there's an interesting project potentially there. And then one of the biggest is um, developing standards for tool interoperability. One of the points Kate mentioned is that there are a variety of tools out there. They all require rather complex workflows to chain together. Uh, it's, it's possible, it's doable, but it's hard. So simplifying it through interoperability is really one of the main themes of the report. Um, so that's the report. We'd like to leave a few minutes here for questions and comments. We really hope to see the report's work brought forward in some way by the community, so we just open ourselves up to your questions at this time.